1947. A hoard of ancient documents is discovered in caves on the shores of the Dead Sea. Scrolls dating back 2,000 years that will come to be recognized as among the most important archaeological finds of the 20th century. But before their true value is realized, they pass through the hands of Bedouin, traders, scholars, and collectors, some traveling as far as the United States. Archbishop Athanasius Samuel, Metropolitan of Jerusalem, opens the leather scrolls of the 2,000-year-old biblical texts, a thousand years older than any previously known. Fifty years later, despite every attempt to bring all the scrolls to light, rumors persist that there are more out there, adding to the mystery and controversy that have surrounded these writings for the last five decades. For those who deal in Dead Sea Scrolls or deal with the secrets they hold, the story is far from over. Jersey City 65, Princeton 63, Cherry Hill 65, New Jersey Instant Weather, every 10 minutes on New Jersey Water. Princeton, New Jersey site of one of America's prestigious Ivy League colleges. This is home to Professor James Charlesworth, an academic who's become a manuscript detective. He's brought to light over 4,000 ancient documents so far. Jim Charlesworth is also an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. As head of Princeton's Dead Sea Scroll Project, he's examined many of the recovered manuscripts and thousands of individual scroll fragments but he's convinced that there's more to the story, that the picture isn't yet complete. I do not believe the greatest discovery has yet been made. We haven't got all of the scrolls. We haven't translated all of them. There are literally dozens of scrolls that we haven't yet been able to piece together. What do they have to tell us? Now, remember when you're putting together a giant jigsaw puzzle, and that's what we're doing, trying to reconstruct the past. When does that piece fit, which all of a sudden you have the picture? For Professor Jim Charlesworth, the search for scrolls is more than a job. It's a passion. I thought we would start with the question, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? But he's equally committed to interpreting scrolls already discovered. The Dead Sea Scrolls are 2,000 years old, not only biblical scrolls, but also previously unknown documents. They're coming from the dark ages in the history of Western culture. A historical gap of over 200 years, Jesus, he lived exactly in this period of silence and his voice... How did our culture take shape? Whether we're talking about our culture, Western culture, or we're talking about Judaism, or we're talking about Christianity, we're talking about the same thing. How did all this stuff get started? For Charles, with the Dead Sea Scrolls may hold the key, and the answers could throw doubt on beliefs held over many centuries. How's the alignment? Can you get the sheens uh, in line so the, yeah, that... The alignment's going really well. All the final yeah. corrections At are Princeton, accurate, just... Charlesworth works on scrolls, weighing the evidence and publishing his conclusions. But he also inhabits another world, the twilight world of scroll trading. For if there are more scrolls out there, and Charlesworth is convinced there are, then he wants to be the first to make a bid for them. I have absolutely no doubt that there are hundreds of fragments out there in whole scrolls. There are individuals, extremely wealthy, probably billionaires, who have purchased these for one reason or another, and uh, they have fragments. Uh, there are fragments in the homes of lawyers and Bedouin and uh, other individuals in Israel today. I do know that there are full scrolls in Amman and in Damascus. Charlesworth knows that many of his leads will go nowhere, but it's a risk he has to take. I am criticized for going after something that's not there. But I have seen fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls turn to dust. I've seen other fragments turn to water because they're so fragile. It's important for me to get them before they disappear. They have never been seen for 2,000 years, but we have to find them before they decay. Charlesworth is not alone in believing that the truth is still out there. In the Judean wilderness that stretches southeast of Jerusalem, other scroll hunters are on the trail. In order to find another cave in the limestone, we need a good earthquake. 
I mean, that's what we need. It's very hard. I mean, you can look at those cliffs and see that there's, you know, a lot of piles of stones and, uh, you know, underneath every pile of stone, there is a chance to find another cave. Hannan Eschel is an archaeologist who continues to scour the cliffs on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. Here, the first scrolls were discovered 50 years ago. Sometimes in the summer of 1947, three Bedouins were climbing up this cliff. And what they found was this cave. Those two entrances were blocked, and the only entrance which was open is this small one. And over there, the jars were standing, and one of the Bedouins, Muhammad Adeib, he told us that altogether he found eight jars. Six of them were empty. One of them was full with soil, and in the last one, he found three complete scrolls. Now he took out his three scrolls and the, some of the jars and went down the cliff back to his tent. He showed it to his cousin and uh, they started to excavate here and they found another four scrolls. So altogether seven scrolls were found by the Bedouins here in 1947. Those first scrolls passed quickly into the hands of a Bethlehem merchant, Khalil Iskander Shaheen, better known as Kando. Suspecting they might be of value, Kando purchased the scrolls from the Bedouin and started looking for buyers himself. The trade in Dead Sea Scrolls had begun. When the Bedouin realized that scrolls meant money, they began to hunt in earnest. As desert dwellers, they knew where to look and unearthed many more scrolls than the archaeologists who were to join the search. In that first decade, the remains of over 800 manuscripts were found in 11 caves. To stop the trade in scrolls and prevent them vanishing again from history, an international team of scholars based in Jerusalem tried to buy the thousands of fragments that came on the market. Although they hoped they'd stop the traffic, they had no way of being certain. But who actually wrote the scrolls? Whose story did they tell? And why were they hidden? As the discovery and trading of scrolls accelerated, Archaeologists began excavating the ruins of an ancient settlement called Qumran, just a mile away from the cave where the first scrolls were discovered. In this room, long tables and short one, and three inkwells were found. One from metal, the rest from pottery. And finding three and the tables together point up to the point that some of the scrolls were probably copied in this room. Evidence began to suggest that the people who lived here had been the keepers of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Archaeologists were convinced they had hidden their scrolls in nearby caves just before their community was destroyed by Roman legions in 68 AD. For 2,000 years, the caves kept their secrets, protecting a legacy from the most formative years of both Judaism and Christianity. In the United States, Jim Charlesworth is setting out on another journey in search of missing links in the Dead Sea Scroll story. His final destination, the Middle East. But first, there's a long detour to Norway. Chasing scrolls is a global pursuit. I really find it kind of mystical to be out in this part of the world, so far removed from the so-called Holy Land, looking for remnants of Jewish writings from the time of Jesus. Somewhere near Oslo, Charles with his following up a lead that a private collector has scroll fragments in his possession. Martin Skoyan is an extremely wealthy man, and now he's dedicating his life to acquiring ancient manuscripts, including the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is uh, the dream that he will have some significant fragments and uh, They'll help us put together the massive jigsaw puzzle of the community that preserved and copied the Dead Sea Scrolls and given us information, data that has revolutionized our understanding of how it all began and how we got where we are now. Jim Charlesworth knows that missing pieces can lead him down two different historical trails. Writings that reflect the life of the people of Qumran can tell him about the first century while the biblical documents they collected and copied 
can reveal how the Bible has developed over more than 2,000 years. Scoyan turns out to have both. Tiny pieces of three of the first scrolls found in cave one, which he bought from two of the early scroll scholars. Is this a fragment of Daniel? This is a Daniel, yes. And uh -huh. it is actually written in the lifetime of Christ and the apostles. And when we look at it with visible light, we can't see come around. And it is the earliest complete manuscript of the Bible. Very important to get them published. Skoyan reveals how one of his pieces fits into a small corner of the scroll jigsaw puzzle. I have put these tiny fragments into its context here, where it belongs. It certainly does look like it fits there. But on the whole, these fragments are too small to be a big help to Charles Mann. This fragment... It's a pity there's not more that you could see, more writing. Well, that's what we have preserved from the first column. Although there's no major breakthrough here, Charles Worth is heartened to find that a collector with a wide knowledge of ancient manuscripts has reinforced his conviction that other scrolls will be found somewhere in the Middle East. Skoyan is convinced that there are maybe cigar boxes full of fragments in the hands of Bedouin. Charles Worth needs collectors like Skoyan. They can afford to buy lost scrolls, which he can then study. But it's difficult. The prices of scrolls have skyrocketed to the point that many people are not interested in playing the game because the prices are way out of line. And I think when the prices come down, uh, then these individuals who have scrolls probably would be able to find someone to help them. On his travels, Charlesworth has found that different collectors have different motives. Now, one reason is it's very lucrative. You buy a scroll or a fragment for maybe $10,000, and if you're lucky, you maybe sell it for $200,000. Another reason is you become very important. You have power, and in many circles, the most powerful person is the one who has something that you want. While Jim Charlesworth travels towards the Middle East, Professor Larry Schiffman of New York University comes at the subject from a different direction. I'd say that what I am is not so much a hunter for scrolls, but a hunter for what's in the scrolls. I've devoted more or less my entire career to trying to understand what the scrolls really say about the very, very important period, those years before the split between Judaism and Christianity, those years before what I guess we could say are the creation of Western religion as we know it. Larry Schiffman is a member of the editorial team that continues to translate and interpret the Dead Sea Scrolls, making sense of what's already been discovered. This difficult process of putting together the jigsaw puzzle, of reconstructing the scrolls, is taking decades to complete because of its complexity. Imagine that you had a New York Times, let's say, and you took only 10 of its pages and then ripped them up and then took 10% uh, of what was on the floor, and now you try to get a sense what is the New York Times. That's really the boat we're in with the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the years that followed their discovery, the daunting task of piecing together 50,000 fragments slowed down the publication process. By the 1970s, it had almost ground to a halt. This frustrated many scholars who weren't allowed access and even provoked conspiracy theories that the scrolls might hold secrets damaging to Christianity. For a whole variety of reasons, the original team, after they assembled the jigsaw puzzle, was not able to get it published. Now, these reasons included illness, uh, alcoholism, death, lack of interest, Israeli-Arab politics. Finally, really, what happened was that there was so much pressure to get this thing published the assignments were given out again, and I would say that by 1991, we were really on the way to getting the material published as it should be. With the scrolls out in the open, Schiffman is now challenging a widespread assumption that they are only important because of what they say about the origins of Christianity. As a Jewish scholar, he sees the scrolls as essentially Jewish documents throwing light on Jewish history. They don't just enlighten a small group of weirdos who went off to the desert and stuck some ancient books in a cave for us to find them. They enlighten us about the whole nature of the Judaism of the period. That's why I'm so excited about them. From their writings, it appears that the people who wrote the scrolls were a group of Jewish dissidents, fed up with the establishment of their day, who left Jerusalem to set up their own sect. 
Now, many scholars use the term Essenes to describe a sect, but the truth of the matter is that we really cannot identify with certainty which sect that was or what group that was that left us the Dead Sea Scrolls. From his work on the scrolls, Larry Schiffman has been able to enter the minds of the people behind the texts, the mysterious community who lived at Qumran 2,000 years ago. We know that they devoted much of their time to praying and studying, which they did for one-third of every night of the year. And the results of their study of God's law, as enshrined in the Bible, were basically enshrined in their texts. Although Schiffman's work is mainly in the study and the classroom, he's not averse to some real scroll hunting himself. I've been contacted on several occasions and followed up leads that went nowhere. And I know others have done the same. For some reason, whenever you start to get close enough that money is starting to be on the table, the elusive scrolls usually disappear off the face of the earth. So I'm wondering if those scrolls really exist. I, I'm pretty doubtful, but again, you never know. Sustained by his belief that there are more scrolls to be found, Jim Charlesworth continues his journey. His next stop, Jordan's capital, Amman. Now, how does one continue in this task of looking for scrolls or looking for fragments? You first of all listen, get to know people, and pretty soon you learn, you hear things. There are, of course, circles in which you hear about basketball or cricket, and other circles in which you hear about scrolls, and the rumors that, hey, have you heard that? And you follow that up, and lo and behold, every now and then you find out, I cannot believe what we have found today. On this trip, Charlesworth's contacts point him south, into the desert, to Petra. Petra was a magnificent trading center when the Dead Sea Scrolls were being copied. I'm eager to meet some of the Bedouin whom I've been talking to for about 15 years. There may be some information there and perhaps even more than information that I need to check out. Though many leads will turn out to be dead ends, Charlesworth is convinced that every rumor, however vague, needs to be pursued. Beyond the fragments, uh, I have no doubt that there are real scrolls, full scrolls, lengthy scrolls, well over 20 feet long, that are in this area and they're moving them out. And they're not in the hands of Bedouins, but through the Bedouins I can get fragments and get words about where this other material is. Here the Bedouin are still acting as archaeologists, still digging, as they had done in Qumran several decades earlier. And the record shows that it's the Bedouin who are the people most likely to know the whereabouts of any new discoveries. I am a professor at Princeton, and I have been here in Petra five times. Oh, welcome, come. The Bedouins from Qumran, they come to so, Petra. Sometimes. Sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. You speak the same caravan. language. Make, caravan. Make caravan. They make caravan. What do they bring with them? Bring some addresses, some eat, some salt from uh, Dead Sea, milk, you know. Mm -hmm. I will. Oh. Uh, antiquities, they bring some antiquities. I know that. I ha they have told me they bring antiquities. Have you seen antiquities come over? But this is uh, the story before my life. Before ah. my life. This is all the story. Yeah. Not, uh, not uh, my life. To Earlier, this yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. If you hear of anything, uh, let me know. This first meeting hasn't yielded any immediate results, but that's not unusual. Getting information from Bedouin is a long process of gaining trust. And in the turbulent world of Middle Eastern politics and culture, Charlesworth has to tread cautiously. See, it's very hard to sift this out because the last thing the Palestinian Bedouin would want would be to let them get in the hands of the people they claim are their enemies. So we're in this turmoil of who do you believe and if they really had material, why would they ever give it to me or, or, or to a Westerner? That's a different culture. They don't want their enemies to benefit. So I really don't know. I was a little frustrated from uh, Petra. We didn't get what I had hoped to from that area. While Charlesworth continues his search for lost scrolls, back on the shores of the Dead Sea, the hunt for documents still in caves goes on. 
It's a quest that has been pursued ever since the original discovery in 1947. Since then, the desert has yielded not just Dead Sea Scrolls, but manuscripts dating from before the Qumran period up to the Bar Kokhba revolt against the Romans in the early second century. 30 years ago, the desert seemed to have given up the last of its treasures. After 65, no more documents were found, not only by scholars, but by Bedouins as well. Now, when I started doing my research, people told me, look, there's no more chance. I mean, the Bedouins found everything. There's no more documents in the desert. There's no reason to excavate it more cave. In 1986, we enter a cave west of Jericho. And in this cave, first of all, we found guns that were hidden there probably after the Six Day War. And then uh, we excavated the cave and we found six documents from the Bokokhva period, one document which is earlier from the Persian period in the same cave. In 93, we found 30 documents lying outside the cave. So it happened to me twice, once in 86 and another time in 93, where I'd found documents in the Judean Desert. In 1996, an attempt to uncover more Qumran documents led Hanan Eshel to try to find a link between the community and Cave One, the original scroll cave, a mile or so to the north. I said, let's start from the site, and let's see if I can find a trail leading from the site to Cave One and Two. Now, while I was walking here, I found those very nice trails leading to this area. And when I came here, I was shocked to see that there's cave here. Nobody recorded them. They're not being mentioned in any of the reports. So, in 1996, together with Magen Broshi, the curator of the Shrine of the Book, we excavated here. And in those two caves, when we got to the floor, we, got, we found hundreds of body shirts and rims of pottery vessels, including cooking pots, storage jars and dishes, and oil lamps. All of them were in those two caves. So I think that I can safely say that those two caves were used for habitation. People lived here during the first century. Charles, with pursuit of the Bedouin connection, takes him from Petra to Bethlehem, where the scrolls originally appeared for sale, to a rendezvous with a man who claims to be the legendary Mohammed Adib, the wolf, who found the first cave containing scrolls. You were a shepherd before you found the Dead Sea Scrolls. How did your life change? We sold the scrolls. When the present people started to talk of the scrolls the Bedouin had found that were fetching this much and that much. We sold them for 16 pounds, but they were worth millions. So we started searching properly. It was worth it. We'd find stuff and bring it to the museum. You looked for other caves? Loads. We worked in caves and emptied them completely. There was one cave we worked for one night, a small one, not a big one. We worked for a short while and found a piece of leather with nothing written on it. But the Jordanian army saw us and started firing at us. We ran away, and that was that. Would you take me to see that cave? I'll show you. Why not? I'm very excited. Does he have a cave? And is there any connection between this cave and the caves at Qumran? That will be very exciting. Even if we don't find a writing in it, to find a connection would be, to me, uh, just uh, uh, very, very exciting. This is good signs. We've got some uh, pottery here, some ancient pottery. And you can see it goes down pretty deep here. 
people have lived in this cave. Curious if this goes somewhere. It looks like it's been filled up, doesn't it? I wonder what's in there beyond there. I can see back into this crevice, maybe 15 or more feet. Looks like a place where some things have been hidden at one time, maybe robbed by Bedouin or has an interesting story to tell, that's for sure. Was it uh, a place for hiding scrolls when the Qumranites fled from the Romans? That's a good question. Here's another little crevice that's very interesting, isn't it? That goes up a long way. It looks very much like many of the crevices in which uh, Dead Sea Scrolls had been placed. Well, there's no question this has been inhabited. Wonder what story it will have to, have to tell us over the years. Are we standing now on uh, scrolls? How far down does it go? Archaeologists have visited this cave, but it has never been fully excavated. It's impossible to assess the layers of history at a glance. To explore it further, he'll have to get a permit. And Charlesworth has every reason to be optimistic. Israeli uh, Talata Romana. Hada, Hada, Hada Israeli. Hada Israeli, Hada Yunani. Aywa, Aywa. Romani. Romani. Exactly. What I thought we have Roman pottery here. Hada Romani. Romani. Hada Israeli. 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 So we have, we have clear evidence of occupation in that one cave from the time of Isaiah down to the destruction of the first century. Jerusalem, where much of the drama of the scrolls has been played out over the last 50 years. It's here in the Israel Museum's Shrine of the Book that the public can see the major scrolls unearthed by the wolf in 1947, an opportunity that three quarters of a million people take each year. But it's in the Rockefeller Museum in Arab East Jerusalem, away from the public's gaze, that the majority of scroll fragments are kept. Here, the delicate business of preservation and piecing together still continues, half a century after it began. Here, scholars can have access to both published and unpublished fragments in their search for what is in the scrolls. In his role as a New Testament expert, Charlesworth is particularly interested in how Christianity took shape and how the unique writings of the Qumran community can enlighten him. What was the world like when Christianity began? We really don't know. We used to know. We used to be so clear, but now we're, we're so convinced that we were wrong. We know we were wrong. Charlesworth has requested access to a controversial fragment. It contains a combination of ideas traditionally regarded as unique to Christianity, but it was written a century or so before Jesus was born. Hey, how you doing, John? Okay, okay, fine. Here's the plate which you requested. This is a very exciting fragment. We're looking at a text, uh, the portions of a text that have remained, how many little fragments we have. A Jewish document that's at least 2,000 years old, let's say the century before Jesus. And there are some very precious ideas that have been preserved in the larger piece here, reference to uh, Mishicho, that is Messiah, the Anointed One, God's Messiah. The reference to the resurrection of those who are dead. And the belief in uh, this is the end of time. So these three ideas... We take uh, some of the Christian ideas like the coming of the Messiah. Now we can find that in some of these Dead Sea Scrolls. Here is the Messiah who will come. 
And that becomes very exciting because we, we now know the coming of the Messiah is not a peculiarly Christian idea or unique to Jesus' followers. We know it is part of the fabric of a very rich culture, to me the most advanced culture in terms of symbolisms and religion and spirituality that I've ever seen. And it's out of this that we're getting little ideas that help us understand big ideas. Christianity, but there's no question none whatsoever to me and to most scholars that are now working in the field, that the origins of Christianity can be felt in these texts, in Judaism. Here is a precious... Now we can understand Jesus' language in terms of its own time, rather than saying, I'll tell you what it means and make it up as we go along. We cannot make it up anymore. We must be dependent upon what the language, what the symbols meant in Jesus' time. It's a very important way of exploring a dark period in history. The Dead Sea Scrolls then are like the giant flashlight that shines into a lost corridor of history. It's insights from fragments like these that drive Charles with the search for more scrolls. And Jerusalem is a good place to do it. Here, rumors of hidden scrolls abound. Just a few days ago, a man came to me from uh, East Jerusalem, an Arab, and he said, uh, we've made contact with some Bedouin who allegedly hid some scrolls uh, south of here, maybe two hours drive south of Jerusalem, and they hid uh, scrolls in the earth, in an earthen vessel, just uh, before or during the Six-Day War, so that would be before 67. So we're kind of running this down. Uh, you have two possibilities. One is a, is a, a you know, kind of a wild goose chase. But then there are reason to think that we better be serious and follow this up. And that's because uh, we have seen fear in the eyes of some of the Arabs. And uh, the Arabs involved are showing that they are very scared right now. And that connects not with it being a, a wild goose chase, but there may be something very important here. The lead takes Charlesworth to the old city and a meeting with an Arab middleman. He hopes to be put in touch with the Bedouin scroll owners. They must arrive now. They are waiting until it's done. It's a lot of money they're talking about. For them, it's something they kept for 27 years. Do you have any idea when they'd be here then? They didn't, they didn't want to do it. They are uh, a bit you know what I mean? It's, uh, I agree. This business, it's, you know how it works. I think they also thinking for the future. Please. Sure. Israeli get the gold, or everybody the same. And exactly. You find it in Israel. Yeah. You find it. Then we have the Jordanian in That's right. Jordanian. You know what we're talking about? We're into smuggling. And yeah, see, this is I what we're talking you about. You could find his corpse and my corpse. Now, we don't want it. Those are tough. Not I know what I'm oh, I, I know, exactly. I agree with you. You're getting off close to something you didn't even dream yeah, of doing. I'm taking off. Maybe we are surprised. Bye. In this whole enterprise, you're working with a real danger. There is no way I'm going to be involved in anything like smuggling a scroll out of a country or a fragment out. My principle is very simple. Where the scroll is or where the fragment is, we should try to keep it and find ways to have it preserved, photographed, so the scholars can learn about it and share what they know with whoever is interested. In a game where the odds are so high, smuggling isn't the only danger. As we search for scrolls, of course, people bring us scrolls and and sometimes the ink is so wet you're afraid to touch it. Obviously we're referring to fakes. I have been looking at scrolls and uh, many of them have turned out to be fakes. You do a study of the leather, do a study of the handwriting, but still some of these people are exceedingly gifted in making fakes. So we work together as a team of scholars and sometimes they are fakes. Charlesworth's patience pays off. The meeting in the old city gives him the chance to examine a scroll from the Bedouin at last. We have here the scroll of Esther. 
that is lined horizontally and vertically so that Hebrew can be hung on it and written right to left, precisely as in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. What's interesting, I'm holding the scroll of Esther, the book that we have not yet clearly found among the hundreds of thousands of fragments found in the 11 caves at Qumran. But we're looking for a scroll that's 2,000 years old, not 50 years old. This is not an ancient scroll. And that's all the difference in the world. For Charlesworth, finding Dead Sea Scrolls is proving difficult. The same was true of Hannah Neschel's search in Qumran in 1996. But though no new scrolls were found from his excavations, other ancient objects were. And it's amazing that in 1996 you still find vessels so close to Qumran that nobody had found. We start excavating, then we realize that we're standing on an area the tents were built. We found even a tent pole that was used there. Most of the members of the Qumran sect were living in tents and huts and artificial caves. As more artifacts are found around the Qumran site, a picture not just of what the community believed, but how they lived is coming into focus. And more knowledge about the authors means more knowledge about their writings. Esti Eschel, Hanan's wife, is an historian and expert on ancient writing who shares her husband's passion for the scrolls. We have a good chance to have a look at first-hand sources that describes the people, thought and belief, and especially this particular interesting group that dwelled in the desert, fighting against the establishment and trying to find their own way in life and belief of Judaism. Her quest to discover the secrets of the people of Qumran is shared by Larry Schiffman. This was a group which believed that the entire world was divided into two camps, the camp of light, the good guys, and darkness, basically, the bad guys. And you were predestined to be in one group or the other. They believed that in the end of days, they themselves and all those who would associate with them by coming to see the light, basically, by realizing who was right in all this, would be saved. Everybody else, Jews and non-Jews, would die in the ultimate view of this group. By combining disciplines, scholars have been able to reconstruct the lives of the people of Qumran. This small group of dissident Jews who abandoned the bright lights of Jerusalem and set up a community in the hills of Qumran that would last for over 200 years. They developed a way of life with beliefs and practices that would later be found in early Christianity and forms of worship and prayer that would eventually influence modern Judaism. Studying for a third of the night and praying as the sun rose and set, they waited for the end of the world a world which ended for them when the Romans invaded. On the southern edge of the Qumran site are three cemeteries where the remains of over 1,200 members of the community still lie. You're standing in the middle of a huge graveyard with no name. You have no signs. You don't know what is the name of those people. And I'm spending a big part of my work trying to figure out their name. In the winter of 1996, Esti Eschel's investigation was helped by the discovery of some writings on a piece of pottery known as an ostracon. A group of volunteers were cleaning the wall here, and they found at the foot of the wall, around here, two pieces of one ostracon, and they took it out and started looking at it, and it was 15 lines written in Hebrew script, dated to the first century. It appears to be a form for new members of the community. On it were the names of a volunteer, Honey, and a leader, Eliezer. Real people. As for Hannah Neschel, it's the graveyard itself that tells him even more about these people. Although the cemetery was not excavated fully, we have only sample of the graves. It's is very important data about uh, the nature of the group, because most of the people who were buried here were very young. They died in their 30s. Only one man got to the age of 65. The ruins of Qumran are slowly giving up their secrets, and the young, zealous Jews who had vanished from history are beginning to re-emerge. For the scholars who are bringing them back to life, it's a unique experience. All 
people who deals with Kuman scrolls, a small community of scholars, that taking very seriously every letter that are written in the scrolls, we're basically showing how a group of young people had influenced Christians and Jews that took God in a serious way. And we can learn from their writing about a very interesting period that influenced all of us today. My own feeling about this group is kind of a two-sided, double-edged sword. On the one hand, I have tremendous, tremendous respect for many of their teachings, for their devotion, for the beautiful compositions that they produced, the willingness to sacrifice anything for what they understood as God's way of life. On the other hand, there are really some teachings that are hard to agree with, like hatred of those who don't agree with you, the feeling that everyone will be destroyed in the end of days. There are aspects here which are really hard to agree with. In the United States, it's the writings of the people of Qumran that are being resurrected in an extraordinary way. Cutting-edge technology is being used by high-tech scroll hunters. Doctors Robert Johnston and Roger Easton of Rochester's Institute of Technology and Dr. Keith Knox of the Xerox Research Laboratories have been developing a new image processing technique. They believe it will reveal writing on scrolls that has not been seen for 2,000 years. Till now, the technique has only been tested on photographs. They are very keen to work on actual scrolls, something that Charlesworth, now back in the States, may be able to help them with. He knows that just 20 minutes west of New York City, in the town of Teaneck, there are Dead Sea Scrolls, parts of which are unreadable. With the help of this new technology, he believes it may just be possible to reveal the lost writings. The fragments arrived here back in 1948, part of a collection brought to America by Jerusalem's then Syrian Orthodox Archbishop, Athanasius Samuel. His scroll fragments are now in the care of the Reverend John Mino. This is just a beautiful liturgical scroll. This mm. is one of, the, one of the fragments that his eminence did keep, and he wished to be maintained by the church mm. here. Let me see the other fragment Certainly, you brought There is today. a second fragment here, Jim, that you may want to take a look at. This, I believe, is from the, from the book of Daniel. Definitely. You can see the word Daniel here in Hebrew. Daleth nun yoth aleph. That's beautiful. This writing is so clear, but I'm very curious uh, if we can get some readings into this area where the leather has turned to liquid, liquefaction, where mm -hmm. the leather de collapses because of the absorption of, uh, of liquid. And of course, we can't see anything in here now with the naked eye, but it would be very exciting if we can get some readings there. You know, go farther uh, left, farther left. Using their state-of-the-art camera with a range of wavelengths that far exceeds the human eye, the team convert the Samuel scrolls into digital data. Ready to shoot. Tension mounts in the room. There's no way of knowing what the camera will reveal. Oh, oh my! Look at <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> look at that! <laughs> Unbelievable! It's fantastic. There you go. There, 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 there you go. There's some there there Unbelievable. Right. Unbelievable. Right. Look at those. Look at that okay. coming out. Yeah. Oh my gosh, can we improve this uh, edition? This should be better. This is the they other. can. At Rochester, the scrolls now in digital form are being processed by the team with the help of research assistant Mithra Musavi. Take the image which shows the writing in both directions, scale them appropriately, and subtract them. You will just see the writing in the other direction. Uh, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> or, or you might see the... In the first part, you can see that we can separate out some characters in, with using infrared light. Uh, what we're going to look at next is to figure out how to take the jumble of new characters that appears and try and sort them out between what's on this surface, what's on another surface, what's behind the scroll itself. Uh, that it may be that there are two pieces of a scroll stuck together, and we're seeing two images. Our infrared image for that. Wait a minute, Let, look at this. See, we have here the piece of a scroll stuck on top of another scroll. And this gets fascinating to me because this gives an indication of that violent period when the Romans were taking the area. 
uh, the only way something gets squashed or stuck on this, it, it looks like we're getting an in, uh, kind of like a footprint from a, a violent time. The most spectacular results come from the application of the new technology to the fragment of Daniel, part of the Bible as used and copied by the people of Qumran. With this text, Charlesworth is convinced that we are within a generation or so of the original version. Comparison with a modern copy may raise questions about the accuracy of the Bible in use today. This is what you were seeing. You'll turn that around for me, won't yep. you? Yes. This is what the, uh, the infrared picture looks like. Oh my. See, we have, we can get this line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We, we've, we've increased this almost double. Prior to this, we were working with a document that is basically around a thousand of the common era. But this can take us back way beyond the time of Jesus to about 100 BC, that's within a decade or so, or a generation or so, of the man who wrote that. And that means we have gone back at least a thousand years closer, and it's the same thing, the same document, except for some minor variations in spelling. For Charlesworth, this is the end of a journey that has taken him across the world and back again, in order to find treasure in his own backyard. It's like we've discovered a new document, or it's mm -hmm. like discovering a new manuscript, yeah. or another Dead yeah. Sea Scroll has been yeah. found, found, shall we say, technologically. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if we find a fragment that has one or two words on it, we're excited, but here we should be ecstatic because yeah. we have lines and lines, plus we already know It, uh, what is, it is clear that there is a large number of these scrolls and scroll fragments that have yet to be examined using techniques like this. We're able to get significant improvements in the readability and the legibility of the characters in the scrolls, and we see that large number of scrolls yet to be examined using this technique as something that we could keep us busy for quite a while. You gave him an idea. <laughs> you could say that the scrolls sent us a message across the two millennia. That message for us today, I think, is to understand the extent to which the variegated nature of Judaism that period gave birth, on the one hand, to rabbinic Judaism, but on the other hand, through a whole variety of transmogrifications and changes and all this, to Christianity as well, which teaches that Christianity has its roots in Judaism and therefore comes to tell us the importance of the kinds of relations between the two groups that we would hope would be there for the future. There is good reason to continue to look for and I'm sure that Cave 12 will be found. I really hope that I will take part in this adventure. But if not, I'm willing that everybody else will do it. As long as we have more documents, and we'll have better data about uh, the people, it's important. What about it? Am I going to continue to look for scrolls and fragments of scrolls? Absolutely. I'm convinced that there are a lot of fragments out there that may help us understand things that we haven't even asked about. So I shall keep looking as long as I live because I've said it repeatedly, I think the great discoveries are yet to be made.